Well, hello and welcome to Preachers on Preaching. My name is the Reverend Joe Gibbs, and I'm delighted to host this series, which is intended to help pulpit preachers give deep spiritual and practical thought to their craft uh, week in and week out. What a privilege it is uh, that we have been given to study and to deliver God's Word. But that is a fearsome task and a difficult task, and it requires uh, a whole career of working on all that we have been given. And so uh, we have a series of preachers, uh, wonderful preachers, who uh, will be lined up to give us their thoughts, their instruction on a variety of topics that we all think about each week. I am delighted and honored to have as our first guest the Reverend Dr. Will Willimon. Dr. Willimon is the professor of Christian ministry practice at Duke Divinity School. He is a retired United Methodist bishop. He is uh, the former dean of the chapel at Duke, and he is a world-renowned author, having over 80 books uh, that he has written about the practice of ministry. Dr. Willimon has some incredible insights about the importance of preaching and what exactly is happening in the preaching event. I can't wait for you to hear it. I hope that you will find it as instructive as I do. Dr. Will Willimon, uh, we're so glad to have you here. It's an honor to have you uh, on this uh, first episode of Preaching on Preachers. Uh, really, you uh, yeah, delighted to have you. Uh, you are the professor of uh, the practice of Christian ministry at Duke Divinity School, a retired bishop of the United Methodist Church, former dean of Duke Chapel, author of too many books to count, and uh, and have been called one of the most influential preachers in America, but not on your resume is that you played in a high school band called the Brothers Four and a Half. <laughs> with your dad. With my dad. With my dad. And he said that you, uh, you could really, uh, you could really hit, hit the licks. Is that right? You, were, you... Uh, No, that, yeah, he, his, his memory is clouded, as people <laughs> our age often get. Well, um, thank you again for being with us. Can you just give us uh, anything I missed, any, a brief bio introduction? And then, um, and then would, who would you say has had the, the greatest influence on you as a preacher? You know, I'd, no single person comes to mind, but I think in the early days, I think people have had strong influences on me at various stages along the way. Uh, Fred Craddock, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, was instrumental in sort of helping me find my voice, uh, Rick Lisher, my colleague here at Duke and preaching for many years, uh, always stresses that preaching begins an imitation. He notes that classical rhetoric, you spent the first 12 years memorizing other people's speeches hmm. before you attempted any of your own. And I think imitation is the way to find one's voice. So Fred Craddock helped me sort of reclaim that kind of Southern storytelling I'd say even biblical storytelling uh, tradition. Uh, Walter Brueggemann, uh, strong preacher. Carl Marnie, a Baptist preacher of another generation, uh, impressed me deeply uh, as a student. But also, I remember William Sloan Coffin when I was a student at Yale Divinity School, uh, hearing Coffin mix it up in a strong, visceral way. Uh, influenced me. And uh, so I, I think I'm indebted to a company of preachers mm -hmm. who at various times, I think maybe <clears throat> rather than sort of impose themselves and their way of preaching on me, 
it may be they serve to evoke aspects of me and my communicative style that made a difference. Mm. I do think learning to preach and growing in your preaching is a form of apprenticeship, looking over the shoulders of somebody else doing it, and then gaining the critical capacity to say, hmm, I wonder why that really gripped me or what worked about that or what didn't work about that. Right. Yeah. That's something that we uh, develop over time, I think. Yes. Uh, well, you have, you've written a lot of uh, books on the practice of, of Christian ministry and particularly uh, about preaching. Uh, many these days would claim that, um, that what, what the church says is not nearly as important as what the church does. Uh, is that true? And, and are sermons relevant for a contemporary <clears throat> age? I'm hearing two things there. Uh, one, biblically speaking, as you, you know, uh, to say something is to do something. It's noteworthy that there are other gods that when they want to create a world, they have sex with other gods, or there's a great cosmic war between the forces of light and darkness. Uh, we know the world is created vocally. <laughs> God uh, just says light, and there is light. And so that, that's at the heart of the biblical testimony. We are so, we, we're also in a, in a, a time when if, if someone is going to say, look, I'd, I'd rather uh, see a sermon than hear one, or it's not as important to speak as it is to do, well, uh, for instance, in the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, moment that we're in, uh, people, language makes a difference. What you name a building, uh, what you, uh, the words you use, there is a sense that those words matter and that violence can be perpetrated even through speech. Mm -hmm. So those words matter. And also say, it's of the nature of the Christian faith. I think that words and speechifying has a kind of privileged place. Uh, Paul says, where do you get faith? Faith comes from hearing. Right. The, uh, the Christian faith is an acoustical phenomenon uh, along with deeds. But I think I could argue that there is a sense in which you, you got to have the words first uh, before you get the deeds and the deeds feed back into our use of language and test our speech. Um, but the two go together in this faith. And maybe this, a, that's a comment, a prejudice comment made by a preacher, but uh, the words, the words lead to the faith. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Uh, so it's really the uh, the way God has has set it up. His sermons are always going to be relevant for for faith. Um, so so let me ask you this: You, you speak a lot about this in, in your book, "Preachers Dare to Speak," which came out uh, in 2020. Uh, a, a really <clears throat> highly recommended work. Um, uh, what it, what exactly is happening uh, in a sermon theologically? Uh, in other words. How much is the preacher speaking, and how much is God speaking? What, what's, the, what's the dynamic going on there? We don't know, <laughs> and we, we're suspicious of anybody who claims to know. Uh, uh, however, for reasons known only to the Lord, uh, preaching is the medium through which this God chooses to get to us. Right. Jesus came preaching, and uh, he came announcing, the kingdom of God is upon you. And maybe somebody said, well, how do we know it's upon us? Uh, somebody did ask that, some of John the Baptist's disciples, and Jesus mentioned specific actions. But Jesus, there, there was a sense in which he, how do you know the kingdom of God has come among you? Because somebody is announcing the kingdom of God has come upon you. And... Um, part of the scandal of preaching well is encapsulated in the second Helvetic confession which says astoundingly 
the preached word is God's word. And that was an affirmation uh, adhered to by all the, the reformers, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, that, uh, that somehow God enters the preaching activity as nowhere else. And these thoroughly human words, and if you know us preachers personally, you know we are utterly human and flawed, uh -huh. that somehow God commandeers our language and uses it to speak to other people. Every preacher has the experience of you coming out of a church on Sunday morning and someone saying, you really spoke to me today, or how did you know? Did, mm -hmm. did, did you know that I was struggling with so-and-so? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have the experience of someone saying, that was really a very helpful sermon on abortion. And you say, whoa, wait, wait, I, I didn't mention abortion in the sermon. I've got the manuscript I can show you. I didn't say that. Well, I think that's kind of an everyday experience of the Holy Spirit descending to my sermon. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a sense, ripping the sermon out of my hands and saying, give me that sermon. I'm going to make something out of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to turn your human words into God's word. I am going to use them to address a life. And that happens in preaching. When does it happen? I usually don't know that it's happened until later. Mm -hmm. Maybe when some layperson six months later says, you know, you remember that sermon you preached on so-and-so? I've been thinking about that. And mm -hmm. I said, really? I can I can hardly remember preaching the sermon. Yeah, really? Right. Well, it, it's, uh, I've been struggling with that for six months. Well, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I think that is a divine Holy Spirit induced action. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of what you're talking about, it really resonates mm -hmm. with what I've, I've read in, in Luther, where he really talks about the preaching event as a, as a sacrament. I mean, the, like you said, the word Absolutely. becomes the word of God. And, and so let me ask you, uh, if that's true, is it always true? In other words, can a, can a preacher... Um, circumvent uh, the spirit, or is it up to the spirit to, to work always? Um, well, you know, the, the Holy Spirit is free uh, to come or to go, <laughs> to show up or not show up. In fact, I think that's one of the challenges of Christian ministry is you realize it is utterly dependent on the Holy Spirit to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And in ministry, you learn you do everything right. You pray, you work hard, you put the time into the sermon, but you're up there preaching and they're dying out there. Uh, it's just flat. Yeah. And I maybe have said to the Lord after a service as I'm divesting in my study, uh, is it too much to ask for you to show up here? Uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm working solo down here. Come on. Uh, Holy Spirit, please. Uh, and the it, it, and it's not a, you know, it's grace. And it ain't grace if it's predictable and yeah. programmable. It's mm -hmm. called gift. And a gift that is received can be a gift withheld. So part of the peril of preaching, if you will, is knowing we don't work alone and we are frighteningly dependent. But maybe I need to pray for the graciousness to name and claim and be grateful when the Holy Spirit descends. And every preacher surely has that experience of, you know, you meant to work on the sermon, but then it was first one thing and then another, and then uh, you, something comes up. And so you get out there and you lay a bunch of cliches on them and you, you know, he ain't heavy, he's my brother and tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree and crap like that. And you just pray they've never been in church in their lives. <laughs> uh, and you say, all right, Lord, amen, let me out of this. And, and I promise to do better next week. Uh, then he grips your hand on the way out of church and tears are in his eye. And he says, you, that's the best servant you've ever preached. And um, later, when you're alone, you say to the Holy Spirit, you know, you did that to make me look bad. Uh, that was a horrible sermon. How dare you bless that sermon? Right. Yeah. I can do better. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, 
that's that's also kind of part of the fun of mm. the preaching ministry yeah yeah right I heard Tim Keller one time say that uh, the, the difference between a bad sermon and a good sermon is the preacher's responsibility, but the t difference between a good sermon and a great sermon is the spirit's responsibility. You know, that's a wonderful quote from Tim Keller, yeah. and uh, I well said, uh, I got my responsibilities, but on my own, I can't do much more than produce an interesting speech, right. and an interesting speech that, that can be a good thing. However, there's I can't take it to that level where someone actually, the, the veil is pulled back, the curtain is opened, and they hear something that cannot be heard through purely human means. So given that the spirit is free, and he will show up when he good and well uh, wants to. Um, what is the preacher's responsibility? How can a preacher prepare him or herself to, uh, to be the vessel of the Lord's voice to his people? I think I want to do everything I can to put myself in a context whereby the Holy Spirit has a chance of cutting through all my stuff and giving me a word that is not self-derived, a, a word that from on high. And I think in Sunday worship, you want to do the same uh, so that uh, we are appropriately focused, uh, appropriately free to hear. I, I love, for instance, the way the Book of Common Prayer does this in a service of the word on Sunday morning or the service of the word and table, uh, whereby we are sort of besieged by scripture. Uh, we are taught to pray as we ought and not as we maybe are inclined to do through the Book of Common Prayer. And the music and the setting and everything else uh, goes together that, that I think it can get there. Uh, a colleague was telling me about a perfectly wretched sermon that he was uh, subjected to uh, the week before in which the preacher could do no better than to quote uh, the lovely young poet uh, from the inauguration. And he said it was a great poem, but it wasn't a sermon. And, uh, and then he said, you know, I am so looking forward to this pandemic being over because I think it's harder for preachers to preach silly, inconsequential sermons when they're in a pulpit in their church building. <laughs> and I said, you know, you may have something there. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, there's just something about sitting there zooming in your study that you can get away with some stuff. Uh, so I, I think the context and prayer uh, attempts to listen to the text through biblical study, uh, all that can contribute and can kind of uh, prepare the soil that we hope the Holy Spirit will show up. At the same time, it may be when the Holy Spirit doesn't show up and you don't get some great insight. Maybe it's training in humility and training. That's, that's when you can thank God you're an Episcopalian and you can say, okay, I admit this, this sermon today is, um, is, is not actually a sermon, but, but, but hey, uh, just just keep praying and, and follow through the next rubrics and and uh, the Holy Spirit will use something else today for you. And in fact, I worry that so much free church Protestant worship is so thin and it's like all the work is being put on the shoulders of the sermon and the preacher. And one, a lot of our clergy are not that talented and able and skilled at preaching, but two, the Holy Spirit, you know, saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna bless this sermon this Sunday. And say, what, well, this is always, no, I, I, I would bless the Eucharist if you were having it, but because you've been so arrogant, you're not having it, uh, sorry, so. <laughs> mm. Uh, on page 63 of, of, of Preacher's Dare, uh, you say this, you say principles for daily life, hints for happier homes, 
tips for trauma recovery, maxims for meaningful lives are rarely scripture's interest and therefore of little concern to preachers. Um, and yet I would observe that many preachers have amassed huge followings uh, with sermons just like uh, the ones you were saying should be of little interest to us. Can you maybe expand mm. on that statement a little further and, and describe what maybe ought to be mm. the preacher's concern? Uh, Joe, as you were reading that statement, I thought, gee, that, that criticizes about 90% of the sermons I hear in my own church family and some that I've preached. Uh, Tom Long, I think it was, said a few years ago that he was worried that he was hearing a lot of wisdom preaching, he categorized it, uh, referring back to like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and uh, that's preaching, which is the best you can say for it is it's wisdom, it's practical knowledge, helpful, uh, three ways to have a happier marriage, uh, four biblical principles for finding joy in your daily work, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, where the preacher is cast in the role of giving advice. Um, and I think, as you say, that appears to have a great following. And not to be unkind, but it, it has a great following because I think we are in a culture that tells us you should be much more interested in you than you are in God. And that preaching is thoroughly anthropocentric rather than theocentric. And it's, uh, you come to church to get advice, uh, to which I say, well, you probably need to find a different guy to offer you advice than the one that is giving you advice now. Uh, but, and it, it, there's so many things wrong with that. I, I think, first of all, it's not biblical. I just, the Bible is a story about God. And I remember James Sanders, one of his hermeneutical principles I found helpful is to say, hey, scripture always and everywhere speaks about God first. And only secondarily or derivatively does it ever talk about us. It, it's mainly saying, hey, 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 stop looking at yourself and your aches and pains or whatever you're going through. Look at God. And uh that's what this sort of advice, and the other thing that concerns me about it is that it's a heck of a position to put the pastor in to say, good morning, are you anxious? Are you feeling stressful? Uh, well, look, here's, here's how you can fix that. Uh, do, hey, preachers, do you really want to cast yourself as the expert on human relations and psychological well-being, uh, sexual fulfillment, uh, come on. And I think the only thing, the, the main thing the congregation has a right to expect of you is, is any word from the Lord? Uh, show us Jesus. Uh, that Now that is something they can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And um, I, the, the kind of arrogance of the, the preachers who say, uh, uh, have you ever thought, uh, I wonder how I can get out of bed in the morning and feel joy uh, in, in each new day? Well, let, let, let me tell you how to do that. Uh, first do this, then do that, then do that. Well, I say, if this sermon is true, then for God's sake, don't, don't bother with Jesus Christ uh, mm -hmm. because... Uh, he says, wake up each morning and take up your cross and follow me. I, that's not, not something you're going to hear from Houston. And um, so, uh, as my friend Stanley Harawa says, if you can find a knockdown principle that leads to a happy life, go worship that. Don't bother with this Jew from Nazareth. Um because that principle will be much less demanding upon you and may even give you a happier life mm. if that's what you call salvation. So, yeah, but, but I think you, you put your finger on one of our, our great challenges. Mm. You know, you offer a, a Bonhoeffer quote in, in the book that really caught my attention. It's on page 38. He says, the richness of the word of God ought to determine our prayer not the poverty of our heart. And you can expand on that uh, all you want, but it made me think 
that it might be true also that the word of God ought to determine our preaching and not the poverty of felt needs. Um, mm. You have just viciously attacked uh, most Methodist sermons, but okay. Well, and many of my own, I'm sure. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love the Bonhoeffer, that, that quote, and, and he's talking about the Psalms and saying that like prayer doesn't come naturally. Uh, you got to be taught to pray in Jesus' name, and that your relationship with God is not determined by your need; it's determined by God, and God—that's God's self-assigned task. Well, while uh, if you'll notice, there's a sermon form among us which just starts out with some diagnosis of the human condition, and then moves from that to say, "Okay, let's let's rummage about in Scripture and see if we can find that." By the way, I think one wonderful check on that is uh, the Revised Common Lectionary. <laughs> because again, I think scripture is mostly concerned with God and showing you re its revelation, epiphany. Uh, so that, that serves as a check on that. Uh, I preached uh, on January the 10th this year in Duke Chapel. And I'd worked on my sermon. Well, after the events at the Capitol on January 6th, uh, I thought, gee, maybe I better redo my sermon because it's going to sound kind of arrogant not to mention that. Um, then we got the inauguration coming up and hopefully that'll put us in a better place and all. Well, I opened my sermon by saying, hi, I let me tell you what I wanted to preach about this morning. I wanted to call down fire on the heads of the entire Republican congressional delegation from North Carolina. And they deserve it. Lord knows they deserve it for their cowardice and deceit. Uh, I wanted to give some good advice to Papa Joe on how to run the country mm. because I'm kind of an expert on how to run the country. Um, but then I went to Mark and Mark said, no, 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 no. Let's do something a bit more relevant. Mm. Let, let's do something a bit more politically radical. Let's talk about the baptism of Jesus. Uh, so Mark won't let me talk about what I want to talk about. So I'm going to have to talk about what Mark wants to talk about. So let's talk about the baptism of Jesus. And then I, I kind of ended the sermon by saying, you know, I hear Mark saying, when the sky turns dark, when you're truly fearful for the future, when the institutions in which you put such faith appear to be crumbling, that's a time you really need to listen for the voice that rips open the heavens and says, you are my son, the beloved. I am so well pleased with you. Uh, so anyway, that to me, that was an example of my being forced uh, by the lectionary, by the church year, uh, maybe by the Holy Spirit, uh, to say, uh, how do you know uh, what's significant about the moment in which you li li live? Uh, oh, American democracy is under attack? Well, maybe, let me beckon you into a world where American democracy is not salvation. Mm -hmm. Salvation is something much more than that. Or, or, Remember now, before you preach your political sermon, remember you live in a world where politics has become the functional equivalent of God. And it is a political, the political is the only way you can accomplish any good in the world. Well, I'm sorry, scripture has a very different view of who's in charge and what's happening. So uh, a lot's at stake in a theological construal of the preaching task. And um, and one last thing is Karl Barth makes the kind of outrageous assertion. Don't begin your preaching with an assessment of your people's needs and desires and problems. Uh, your people are deceptive. They are evasive. They are arcane. They hide. They are masked, etc. Uh, you know more about Jesus Christ than you do about your people. 
because Jesus Christ is so wonderfully revealing. He mm. wants you to know who God is, what God is up to. So preach about that. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's a word for the present moment. Hmm. Well, that's instructive uh, to me. That was not exactly my tack on uh, January 10th. So that's uh, that's that's a help. That's a helpful, uh, <laughs> well, helpful word. Uh, well, no, that's good. That's good. Um, so let me just conclude this great conversation. And I, I mean, gosh, I feel like we could have several, uh, many more episodes with you. But uh, what are some things that a preacher um, ought to do, would be wise to do over the course of a career to hone his or her craft, um, both as a speaker and as one through whom God speaks? Um, be born in South Carolina. That's very important. Yeah, that's important. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, one, stay in love with scripture. Um, just keep trying to be naive and amazed on a weekly basis. Preachers ask me, how do you keep at it this many years? And I, I say, I, I got to give a lot of credit to scripture that it seems like on a weekly basis, I go to scripture and one of the lections will smack me with something that I say, I, I could have never come up with this on my own. Uh, wow, that is weird. That is wonderful. And um, so I think scripture is a key. I think also in a more mundane way, listen to other preachers. Uh, Joe, you wouldn't know this, but when I was a young preacher just starting out, uh, I was desperate to hear other preachers. And I used to get up early on Sunday morning and put my little cassette recorder next to the radio as Edmund Stimely boomed out over the Protestant hour from New York City. And then I would take that cassette as I would drive to the hospital in Lawrence and uh, to visit and listen to that again and again and again. And wow, now on the internet, you can hear everybody. Uh, so easy, yeah. Uh, I heard 30 sermons by Tim Keller uh, and on CD is that a layperson handed me. And uh, I noticed I started like walking around condemning people uh, but, but anyway, uh, and, uh, but, 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 so I've, you use that internet and enjoy uh, being pushed by colleagues, because I think preaching is, it's not a science, it's not an art as much as a craft, and the way you learn a craft is by watching masters do it, and looking over their shoulder, and saying, I can do that, and so I'm, I'm, I'll stop it those two ways. I think keep one alive and keep one growing and and promise yourself too that if if you wake up and it, a, a Sunday morning is just a chore to you and you feel a, a great sense of fatigue and all uh, get out because one that takes a terrible toll on you, but also God's people need more than ever to hear God's word and um, the way God seems to reveal is through us frail fallen ordinary preachers mm. yeah it's a humbling thing and it? it is it 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 is a humbling thing uh and it is it, it's also an invigorating thing it just Th those moments I remember coming out of Duke Chapel and this student said to me uh, thank you he said I just sometimes I feel like being a Christian I'm just under assault all the time thank you for giving me the guts uh, you know another week at Duke and I said wow but thank you. And uh, this followed by a woman who come out. She said, you know, I am just fed up with your arrogant uh, left wing preaching, etc. I said, well, I hope you'll take this in the right way. Uh, actually, I don't care because that kid there who's 
19 years old, just told me what I said was great. Do you know how hard it is to get a compliment out of a 19 year old? Uh, so while I'm concerned that you're not happy with my preaching, uh, wow, I'm good. <laughs> that 19 year old said, thanks. Uh, which may say one thing about preaching is be careful who you listen to. Uh, maybe a good question to ask for preachers to ask is who validates my preaching? Uh, who ultimately, to whom am I ultimately accountable in my preaching? Well, anyway, but awesome. thanks, Joe. Thank you, Dr. Willimon. God bless you. And uh, really appreciate all that you uh, uh, have done for the for God's church. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you.